Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Collins, and as Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'm absolutely de delighted to welcome you uh, to the latest in our series of IIEA webinars. This is a public webinar, and we're delighted to be joined by our IIEA members, as well as the wider members of the public. A very warm welcome to all of you, particularly if you're joining an IIEA webinar for the first time. It is great to see the level of interest in today's event, not only from here in Ireland, but internationally as well. On behalf of the IIEA, it is an extraordinarily great privilege to welcome President Michael D. Higgins here this morning. We are honored that President Higgins is the patron of the Institute and that he is someone who shares a vision of Ireland as an active, informed and ethical contributor to the world around us. The President will speak to us this morning on a topic that he has been passionate about right throughout his political career and argue that this is a time for us in Europe to reassess our relations with Africa. The President will address us for about 30 to 35 minutes and then we will have time for your questions. We'll try and take as many of these questions as we can and you will be able to submit these questions or any questions that you have either now or throughout the course of the events using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. A reminder that this discussion is fully on the record, both the President's speech and the subsequent discussion. And just a little further reminder that you can join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. We're also live streaming the event on our YouTube channel. So many thanks once again to the hundreds of you joining us through these mediums. As someone now in his second term in office and who on his re-election in 2018 had the distinction of securing the largest number of votes ever in an Irish presidential election, President Michael D. Higgins requires no further introduction. It is therefore my high honor now to hand over to President Michael D. Higgins, Uchtaron de Heron. President Higgins, the floor is yours. I am delighted to be with you all today, even if it has to be in a virtual sense, to address the important topic of how we might pursue the most fruitful relationships between Africa and the European Union, how Europe might release itself from the narrative of the past and be a part of a narrative of hope, be engaging as equals with our planet's neighboring continent of the young. This is indeed a topic on which I, as President of Ireland, have spoken on several occasions a topic about which I feel passionately. For the quality of the European Union's relationship with the continent of Africa and its people is a subject of such great importance, a topic which carries hope in its transformative potential for so many, yes, for Africa, but also all of us as we seek to address the issues of our time, including the dysfunctional balance of economy, society, culture, and most importantly, ecology and the loss of biodiversity. So may I first thank the Institute for International European Affairs for the invitation to address you and compliment the Institute, which has in recent years become such a critical resource for sharing ideas and evidence that are helping to influence policy at European and global levels. We have now the gift of new empirically based research published on Africa. For Europeans, the issue is, do we read it, respond to it, allow it to influence policy and our European Union-Africa relationship and agreements? For example, the subtitle Carlos Lopez and George Cararach gave to their recently published valuable work Sustainable Change in Africa is Misperceptions, New Narratives, and Development in the 21st Century. I was struck by something most basic when I first read the book. It was how the Mercator projection, I understand still used by Google, has suggested to generations of Europeans that the continent of Africa is about the same size as Greenland. Greenland is in fact 14 times smaller Mercator's 1569 cartographic definition of the world became one of the most influential and widely circulated world map projections throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the authors write. The authors go on to point out 
that indeed the landmass of Africa is the size of India, China, the United States, and most of Europe combined. And that Africa's blue or maritime economy is even bigger than its landmass. Indeed, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is about half the size of the European Union. When it comes to the continent of Africa, we have so many misperceptions, however, to undo. Misperception is perhaps misleading, for indeed the distortion of African realities has a long spectrum that includes early on, for example, the racist language of David Hume in his essay of national character in 1748. To in the present, the annual reports of certain extraction companies in contemporary times. And of course, if we are to undo misperceptions, we must reconceptualize, redo development theory and practice, international trade, architectures of debt and dependency. It is significant too that anthropology is missing as a tool in the contemporary accounts. That great intellectual and moral impulse to understand culture seems to have been consigned with the decline of empire to the shelves of history in libraries. Anthropology is a project that serves so well empire, yet of course it could yield valuable insights if utilized today for a different purpose. Today, Africa is the continent of the young, accounting for 20% of the young people of the world, a continent of over 1.3 billion people in 2018. It constitutes 16% of the world's human population. It is therefore a continent on which the hopes of so much of our shared future rests. It is on this continent we might perhaps see the playing out to fruition of our efforts at achieving the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, of an adequate anticipation and response to climate change. In short, achieving that connection between economy, society, ecology and culture that we so urgently need and cannot postpone, involving as it does the future of the planet itself as a habitable space. A 21st, for Africans, there is the need for reducing poverty, for security and the basic necessities of life, for delivering healthy living conditions, for universal basic services, including education and healthcare, for peace and reconciliation and an end to conflict, and for an enduring, sustainable future built on prosperity in the widest most fulfilling, inclusive sense. For the achievement of a fruitful dialogue between the European Union and Africa, there are preliminary tasks to be accomplished at European level. One of the most important being abandoning any affected amnesia as to the brutal colonization of previous times. The detritus of imperial subjugations which surface too often stirred by fingers of hands that are carrying the old intent. For while Europeans choose to forget, Africans rightly remember. We must transact that painful memory if we are, as Hannah Arendt might put it, to stop the events of the past, crippling us in the present and obstructing us in the future. I worry that we have not reached the point of critical sophistication that will enable us to do that. For I recall the dismissive response I received myself to a quotation I made in one of my papers some years ago from one of Sankar Muthu's books. I think it was Enlightenment Against Empire. We do really need to be free and courageous in critiquing empire in the same way as we have been willing to set about critiquing the extremes and possible abuses of nationalism past and present. Ireland's relationship with Africa is quite a unique one, be it from the work of Roger Casement to contemporary non-governmental organizations and Irish aid. 
It has, unlike the historical relationship of former empires, been largely one of identifying with the aspirations of Africans for lives of freedom from hunger, access to education, achievement of inclusive rights, including the full rights of women to participation in all aspects of life. These are powerful foundations upon which to press upon the European Union the need to develop a future relationship with the continent of Africa, which will be one of African agency in a transformed Africa. Ireland brings to the African table its own experience, not only of an economic, social, political domination, but also the experience of a suppressed culture, forced exile, and frankly, of racism, as Hume again put it in the specific case of the Irish, they having missed out on the civilization that he thought a Roman occupation might have brought them, were thus left uncivilized, but above all else lesser. Ireland welcomes the centrality of African agency in the new work of the transformation of Africa and sees it as having an immensely valuable contribution, having a global consequence as we redefine economics and its connection to ecology and culture. Ireland has from missionaries to aid and development workers, a special connection among African nations resulting from its contribution to education. And we can as a result be looked on as a source of leadership in other areas, such as addressing those unfair and imbalanced terms of trade but currently prevail, which, for example, confine Africa's benefit from its coffee trade to a paltry 10%, and the appalling trade conditions imposed on coffee products, for example, produced in Africa that limit any gains in the value of finished products locking African products to the lower end of the value chain. Not only as President of Ireland, but through a lifetime in Parliament, I've often stressed that Ireland needs to continue to deepen its diplomacy with the continent. That will, after all, be the birthplace of over two billion people by 2050, a continent of such population that quite scandalously continues to be underrepresented on the Security Council of the United Nations, free to offer its own version of African needs and possibilities. Ireland's deepening of diplomatic representation in Africa is currently underway, and it is something I've been very glad to hear. It is not only in addressing the underrepresentation of the people of Africa that Ireland can give elite, however, at the United Nations, Ireland can show leadership in calling for an urgent review and redesign of the architecture of the global financial institutions, an architecture that has for so long now passed purpose, an architecture, an architecture that has not succeeded in preventing our planet in ecological terms being brought to the brink of survival itself, that has failed to eliminate global poverty, that has deepened inequality, that has lost cohesion between and within the populations of North and South, and has left a world where conflict is endemic. And that conflict is never short of armaments produced in countries, including some the European Union, countries that often speak of peace. Given all of this and what Africa now faces in conditions of pandemic, offers such a as, for example, a suspension of six months' interest and debt, as proposed by the G7, should be seen for what it is, a grossly inadequate gesture offered from a distance by those not sufficiently engaged with the human dimension of their proposals in a financialized global economy that eschews any notion of a moral compass. Last month, Ireland became the 27th non-regional member of the African Development Bank. This is an important addition to the deepening ties that will inform Ireland's relationship to Africa and its people. The African Development Bank and the African Development Fund 
It administers can play an important role in fostering sustainable and inclusive social and economic growth and prosperity, helping the African continent to achieve its potential in a sustainable way as the continent of promise and opportunity. For Africa is just that, a continent where transformation is already underway, in that we can be partners. The African Development Bank is currently implementing a 10-year strategy to 2022, focused on two objectives, inclusive growth and green growth for Africa, aiming for prosperity that is more equally shared and meets the needs of present generations without compromising the well-being of future generations. This also involves the taking into consideration of the differing social, economic, and environmental aspects that arise in the sustainable development of countries that have differences that must be recognized. To achieve these objectives, the bank has set five operational priorities, including infrastructure development, regional economic integration, private sector development, governance and accountability, and upscaling skills and technology training, together with three areas of special emphasis, namely fragile states, gender, and agriculture, and food security. A disbursement of $6.6 .6 billion occurred in 2018 to successful projects in these priority areas. There have already been many great achievements resulting from such funding. For example, 100% of new lending from the African Development Bank on energy projects in 2017 was on renewables. That was up from 14% in 2015. And just last week, a new solar farm on the outskirts of Mogadishu should, according to its owners, quadruple power generation for the Somalian capital, whilst also cutting costs. It has provided 8 megawatts of clean electricity since March and is predicted to provide 100 by 2022. Technology has also given other benefits, contributing significantly to the enabling of democratic processes, in line with the freedoms that characterize democracy today. Today, more Africans can access the internet, use mobile phones, and share information with the world at large. The total sub-Saharan African population with internet access has almost tripled from 7% in 2010 to nearly 22% in 2017. Likewise, the number of mobile phone subscriptions in sub-Saharan Africa has almost doubled to 764 million in the same period, according to Dan Alep Rondes' analysis, the role of the African Deve Investment Development Bank and the Future of Africa that was published by the Center for Strategic and International Studies in October last year. Our membership, Ireland's membership of the African Development Bank and its trust fund is an investment in Africa's potential and Ireland's partnership with these important regional multilateral institutions will both advance our shared but redefined development priorities. Membership and investment will open, of course, future opportunities for Irish science and technology in the region, as well as support projects that spur food security, sufficiency, poverty reduction, and sustainable economic development at different levels across Africa. Africa, the smart continent of the future with a civilization of sufficiency and inclusion, can be an exemplar, I believe, a leader in the better and inclusive use of technology. As our world in all its different circumstances continues to respond to the threat to individuals, families, communities, societies and economies. It is difficult to overstate the toll that the COVID-19 pandemic has taken. The lives cut short, the, the space and time for the expression of grief curtailed for those who have lost their loved ones. Lack of access, denial of liberty. Those experiencing severe illness or who are vulnerable. Livelihoods, made it livelihoods themselves, so many 
made insecure or lost for millions of families. Coronavirus being a global problem necessitates a global response. Yet it is so, it is so plainly evident that societies differ in their capacity to respond, such as those in Africa who are in a profoundly exposed position in terms of resources. For example, the proportion of the population that is reliant on the informal economy that prevails and the consequent limitation that results on the measures that may be utilized in responding to COVID-19. So while the pandemic is a global threat, our global vulnerability differs greatly. These differences test both our global solidarity and the architecture of our multilateralism now so much under threat. COVID-19 is a reality in all countries of Africa. We should therefore remind ourselves that there is now an unprecedented opportunity for Europe to begin its journey towards a new contemporary and future shared ethical relationship and do so not only as good regionalism, but also as an exercise in multilateralism, forging a new approach in its relationship with Africa, this time based on solidarity, one that will include a fundamental re-examination of how unfair trade and existing debt structures are impeding not only the capacity to respond to COVID-19, but also the necessary transformations which a continent is getting underway with an African agency that seeks a new form of partnership with its most proximate neighbor, the European Union. May I suggest that now is not a time for retreating behind borders in Europe. In the African countries, where COVID-19 has arrived in greatest numbers. There are immense problems and inequalities in terms of healthcare provision. The same is true, tragically, of Latin and Central America. Given such inadequacies of equipment and personnel, where it is most needed, there is a real risk that the pandemic could be difficult to contain across Africa and Latin America, and could result in mass facilities, mass fatalities, and wider socioeconomic problems, particularly in the possible event of a second wave of the virus. The prospect of a future vaccine does not come guaranteed despite multilateral requests as to whether it is widespread availability will be made possible in for impoverished nations. There is need for a global response as to the freedom and capacity of access of all to a vaccine that will have been after all probably developed with shared global research, both state and private. United Nations Secretary General Gutierrez has correctly underscored how if COVID-19 is to be countered, richer countries must assist those less resourced or potentially, as he put it, face the nightmare of the disease spreading like wildfire in the global south, with millions of deaths and the prospect of the disease re-emerging where it was previously, re previously suppressed. The unresolved issues of hunger are now, in 2020, all exacerbated. According to recent research published by Oxfam, coronavirus could double chronic humber, hunger in Africa. Double chronic hunger. Both the virus and the restrictions imposed to curb its spread are disrupting planting, harvesting, the movement of farm labor, and the scale and distribution of produce across Africa. There are urgent calls for borders to remain open for essential agri-food trade. In this context, it is necessary to recognize how dangerously fragile, often shallow at times, at times contradictory, the practice of multilateralism has become, how some conflicts have been continued, even as the United Nations recently called for a ceasefire to enable citizens and their governments to respond to the challenges posed by the coronavirus. In addition, in addition to the threat posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, many African countries, particularly those in the east of the continent, are now in the throes 
of a second wave of desert locusts, many times worse than the plague that descended a number of months ago. The locusts present an extremely alarming and unprecedented threat to food security and livelihoods, according to the United Nations. A swarm of just half a square kilometer can eat the same amount of food in one day as 35,000 people. Yet we must be cognizant that once the COVID-19 crisis is over, all of the inherited and acquired structural impediments to Africa's sustainable development remain. Perhaps the largest of these impediments remains debt. It is surely one of the greatest global failures, the continuing failure to achieve the will of the members of the United Nations so often expressed in relation to making debt and credit flows serve as instrument rather than stranglehold be it in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals, climate change, migration, or pandemics. Responding adequately to structural global inequalities can, by inter alia recognizing African agency, provide Africa with the prospect of carving out a path to recovery of its deep and diverse culture. peace and a hopeful future, not only for all its citizens, but for us all, for the achievement, I repeat, of a sustainable connection between economy, society, and ecology. I use the word agency very deliberately, as I agree with development economist and high representative of the Commission of the African Union, Carlos Lopez, that it is through the creation of African agency that capacity to act autonomously and independently, which has been denied to Africa at so many points during its colonial and post-colonial periods, that Africans will be enabled to undertake the necessary structural reform so as to create a brighter, shared future. There are some basics that it is necessary to repeat. The health of the populations of the planet must take precedent over any abstracted version of global debt in a financialized econ global economy. Statistics illustrate, for example, in 2016, Angola spent nearly six times as much serving external debt as it did on public health care. 15 countries in sub-Saharan Africa spent more paying creditors abroad than on doctors and clinics at home. This is morally outrageous for us all. Furthermore, Sub-Saharan Africa spends less than 5% of its total government expenditure on public health, a consequence in part at least of the debt-ridden nature of its economies. There is now surely an unanswerable case for a global campaign to achieve universal basic services and to eliminate the obstacles to that achievement. And when it comes to trade and the economy, recent low commodity prices have, of course, led to decreased revenues, with African exports having declined by approximately a third in recent months alone. The Chinese economic slowdown has impacted severely on African exports, given the high dependency of many African countries on the Chinese market. Furthermore, many African countries collect relatively low levels of taxation revenue by international standards. As I have already stated, this is because the estimates indicating that as much as 89% of the people in some states and even regions work in the informal economy, compounding the economic challenges facing the continent. Sub-Saharan Africa remains one of the least industrialized regions in the world, and the modern industry that is currently in place struggles to keep pace with what are usually referenced as international productivity metrics. If labor productivity has stagnated or declined in many African countries over the past 60 years, only to recover modestly since 2000, and gross domestic product has tripled in the same period, serious wealth and income distribution questions are raised. 
the 3,000 wealthiest in Africa, have the same amount of reserves as the central bank, 400 billion euro. Jobs distribute income. And even if in some parts of our planet industrialization has been irresponsible in ecological and human terms, yet in Africa, there is an, industrializ an industrialization, as Lopez and Carrack point out, that can be appropriate for Africa on best use of resources, natural and human. And critical, too, is the transfer of science and technology on new terms in favor of sustainability throughout our planet. The external shocks I referred to earlier, including China's slowdown and fall in commodity prices, as well as the widespread drought in eastern southern Africa, have led some industries to become a drag on their economies, rather than being the engines of growth or available for structural transformation. This is all the more worrying because Africa is still predominantly specialized in relatively low technology industries with a huge dependence on agriculture. And, and findings from some of the better work in the development economics field suggest Africa's long-term development would entail a diversified move away from exporting raw materials and the attendant reliance on high commodity prices. Entry, as it were, into a more complex, advanced set of activities that yield a higher place in the value chain, higher value goods and services for export, thereby increasing the share of GDP derived from advanced manufacturing and improving competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis other world markets. What, dear friends, then, are the prospects for these developments? Let me quote, if I may, from Carlos Lopez and George Carrarac's book, Structural Change in Africa. This is what they said. Five decades of development planning have not yielded the 7%, which is the minimum required to double average incomes in a decade. Instead, there are a range of highly unequal and vulnerable economies that remain entrenched in poverty. The evolution of industrial policy in Africa mirrors, mirrors the, evol the evolution of development planning. These include the import substitution policies that took root after independence. Then planning was enthusiastically driven in the 1960s through to the 1970s. Then came the structural adjustment programs of the 1980s, when planning waned and the stage was rolled back. And then this was followed by poverty reduction strategies, so-called, papers in the 1990s, derived from that time when liberalization, deregulation, and privatization were entrenched as methods of economic management. The weaknesses in understanding Africa, as well as its misrepresentation during these periods, has a great deal to do with the deficits in industrial production and the incidence is indeed of deindustrialization. And this is ironic since most governments implemented various industrial policy strategies and interventions to promote industrial development. As Lopez and Carrack put it, manufacturing as a share of output and employment decreased or remained low over most of these periods. As African countries prepare to take their rightful places in the future global economy, they have a real opportunity to promote economic transformation through the industrialization process by capitalizing on the continent's abundant natural resources, adding value to them while also supporting the development of infant industries. The manufacturing sector in particular has been the engine of economic development for the majority of developed countries, and very few countries have developed their economies without a strong manufacturing base. So much so that the terms industrialized and developed are often used interchangeably when referring to such countries. That is what Lopez and Carrack have said. As with many other global issues, establishing the root causes of Africa's political and economic challenges is fundamental for understanding the dynamics of the African continent, which as indeed Lopez and Carrack correctly identify. It requires an understanding of how the issues of geography, economy, and demography have influenced and will continue to influence Africa's development. 
Returning, if I may, to the ethics of transformation and a meaningful multilateralism, it is critical to recall that between the 1870s and 1900, Africa suffered European imperialist adventurism and aggression, diplomatic pressures, military invasions, and eventual conquest and colonization, suppression of culture. Despite many African societies' brave resistance, foreign domination was successfully imposed. And by the early 20th century, much of Africa, except Ethiopia and Liberia, had been colonized by European powers. The European imperialist push into Africa was motivated by factors that were not just economic, but also political, social, cultural, and frankly racist. The colonial drive followed the collapse of the, pro the collapse of the profitability of the slave trade, its abolition and suppression, as well as the expansion of the European Industrial Revolution. So an interplay of economic factors the imperatives of capitalist industrialization, including the demand for assured sources of raw materials, the search for guaranteed markets and profitable investment outlets, as well as political factors, including inter-European power struggles and competition for preeminence, together with social factors, such as rising unemployment in Europe and poverty, all led to this scramble for Africa. The colonization was characterized by frantic attempts by European commercial, military, and political agents to declare and establish a stake in different parts of the continent through inter-imperialist commercial competition. The declaration of exclusive claims to particular territories for trade. The imposition of tariffs against other European traders and claims to sole control of waterways and commercial routes across and out of Africa. The arbitrary national boundaries that followed have been largely responsible as a source for ethnic conflicts on the continent due to the forced separation of ethnic groups across states and the forced assimilation of others within states. Colonialism also replaced the pre-colonial governance structures with Western ones creating a system of kleptocracy in some nations through the formation of hierarchical ruling structures. Economic rewards given to African elites created a dominant leading class at the expense of all Africans and the continent's natural resources. Despite the demise of colonialism, some elites have remained and maintained their relationships with former colonialists as part of a shared corruption in so many parts of Africa. Such elites are being continually rewarded for draining their state's natural resources and thereby reinforcing inequality. Colonialism furthermore created single crop economies in societies that relied overwhelmingly on agriculture, thus sentencing African economies to the volatile whims of markets and market-based fluctuations and exposure to crop failure. Forced integration of developing states into the international trading arena augmented the already widespread inequality between developed and developing states. But central to colonization was indirect rule and assimilation and a consistent theme propagated by the imperialists was the portrayal of the indigenous Africans as uncivilized and uneducated. This racist notion, widely promulgated, legitimized at home, and rationalized more accurately at home, the ill treatment and exploitation of those who were colonized, including their relegation to the status of second class citizens in their own countries. As to the future, then, the basic physical conditions for economic transformation may be challenging, and to different degrees in many, but not all, African countries. Small but fragmented markets, poor infrastructure, remoteness, sometimes a scarcity of relevant natural resources, they all play their part in the continued poor trade and wider economic performance of many African countries. Yet, even when these factors are taken into account, 
However, there remains a large unexplained residual. It is good, therefore, that a new generation of scholars that includes, such as Professors Lopez and Cararac, are examining these structural features of the African economy that account for its past record and are serving to impose limitations on its future development. I'm not so sure, however, may I mischievously suggest that they have sufficiently departed from the notorious modernization theory with all its linear assumptions, ideological assumptions. Yet what is most important is their suggestion as to what is possible and that will include an appropriate form of industrialization that can be ecologically well fitted and adjusted to local capacity. For if then, if Europe is sincere about its wish to be a partner in enabling Africa to achieve an inclusive, sustainable and prosperous future, debt cancellation must be an intrinsic element of a new authentic European-led response. It is my strong view that a temporary cancellation of debt interest would not suffice as any effective response. Rather, a much more radical approach is required to effectively relieve Africa's debt burden by restructuring, redefining, and in some cases, foregoing the bulk of outstanding debt. Supporting such an approach would be a fitting demonstration of a genuine European solidarity with our neighbors to the south and it could help to consign to the category of transacted memory, transacted painful memory, so much of the horrendous consequences of hundreds of years of colonial and post-colonial hubris, exploitation and abuse. And there is such strong evidence that our current development models are in disarray or producing dysfunctional consequences. So a new model must come from a genuinely inclusive dialogue, enabling Africa to become self-sufficient and to develop sustainably. It will require giving agency to Africans to build a sustainable future for all Africans. Why debt con cancellation will help in this regard is by allowing strategic commodities that are held by the state to be used for the purpose of economic advancement for all rather than serving debt repayments. Improving agency also requires alterations to the forms of bureaucratic and governmental systems in place in some African nations so as to achieve inclusivity and accountability. It will also necessitate that there is a willingness on the part of the state to work inclusively with civil society in its engagements with external partners. African agency is not about the freedom to imitate failing paradigms. Neither should African agency be solely seen as emanating from and being exerted solely by government elites. Rather, it can be a byproduct of independent civil society and progressive movements across Africa at individual and societal levels, working with their entrepreneurial versions of the state towards shared goals. Agency also relates, importantly, to the multilateral level. I've said it already. The ongoing underrepresentation of African nations in international organizations, including the United Nations, surely is a major cause for concern. And we should all be concerned at this underrepresentation, an underrepresentation we continue to witness, an un historic, unjust underrepresentation of an Africa which was then still ruled by colonial powers when the United Nations came into existence and the Security Council established. Africans must be allowed to have influence in council decisions affecting their own continent. The increasing effect of climate change on international peace and security gives this proposal even greater urgency. A 21st century African under enlightenment, dear friends, is underway. And may I suggest it can draw on sources deeper and richer than any limited European 18th century rationalism. For example, it can draw on a diversity of pre-imperialist sources of wisdom as well as the vigor and energy that comes from being the continent of the young on our planet. And to enable such a transformation requires us Europeans 
to reconceptualize development models in relation to Africa and indeed elsewhere, to emphasize the need to seize the possibilities of transformational change, to be partners, partners with a listening capacity as we offer our help in the efforts to build a sustainable future for the planet. As of what is already underway in Africa, we have examples available to us. We can build on excellent initiatives already receiving assistance from the European Union, such as the Great Green Wall, a project led by the African Union, which aims to transform the lives of millions of people by creating a mosaic of green and productive landscapes across North Africa, thus combating the effects of desertification. The key structural changes that are required in relation to Africa have been identified, as I have said, by African scholars such as Carlos Lopez, George Carrack, and many others. These include changing politics, respecting Africa's diversity, embracing a deeper understanding of the policy and historical context, not defeated by it or its consequences, move to sustainable industrialization, increasing agricultural productivity and diversity, building a new social contract, adjusting to climate change and inserting agency in the relationship with Africa's key partners, especially China. An effective European input into an African 21st century enlightenment requires an agreed and appropriate definition of what is meant by structural transformation. As Lopez and Carrack have written in the work I've already quoted, Structural Change in Africa, Misconceptions, New Narratives and Development of the 21st Century, it requires an understanding that while Africa seeks transformation, it is not alone, and that any such transformation must be grounded in eco-social sustainable policies. It requires to a proper understanding of the role of new forms of sustainable industrialization in any transformation, as well as other key enablers, such as an innovative development finance. Whatever policy proposals that are made now and in the future must accept that it is past time, that the residues of the imperialist mindset succeeded as it was by the idea of progress, modernization theory, with its ethnocentric linearities, must be issued from informing assumptions in policies, diplomacy, and scholarship. I so agree with the scholars I have quoted that such residues continue to permeate modern-day misconceptions of Africa, often propagated in ignorance by the media, misconceptions, misreadings, that are not only cartographic, as I opened with, but also pervade work on risk perceptions, levels of conflict, problems of political stability, and other spheres of human existence. Such misconceptions far too often portray a continent in continual crisis, despite that continent having made significant progress in recent years. Such accounts usually form the basis of an unhelpful and inauthentic narrative about Africa that portrays a gap between perception and reality regarding its transformative potential. I'm not for an instant discounting the need for institutional change. Of course, an overall commitment to good governance and state well-being is needed in many African states as a prerequisite, and this cannot be used as an excuse for shirping Europe's moral and ethical obligation to progressing and being partners in Africa's overdue economic and wider social transformation. We need now, all of us, to move beyond our prescriptive approach to dealing with African challenges, an approach that often resulted in programs of aid in the past that were externally imposed, conceived and applied without proper understanding of the crucial need for African agency. They were offered, I think, and imposed indeed, without due cognizance of history in the context of Africa as a diverse, fast-changing continent. Perhaps it is even an appropriate time to return to using old tools in our task, I've already said it, such as anthropology. I agree with Lopez and Carrack that a paradigm shift in African Union, European Union relations is now urgently needed. Our challenge as Europeans must therefore be to forge that new relationship with Africa 
by arriving at a new place founded on real multilateralism and solidarity so that we can be ethical partners in the necessary structural change that can deliver universal basic services and transformational prosperity in Africa and an enduring sustainable future a sustainable development future for the continent of the young on which those of us who believe in global social justice and solidarity place so much collective hope. Thank you all for listening and participating and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, President uh, Higgins, uh, for this uh, incredibly wide-ranging and indeed uh, inspiring uh, address. We're, we're deeply grateful to you uh, for to taking the time this morning to um, address us so comprehensively on an issue on which you, you clearly uh, speak uh, so passionately. Uh, so there's so much to reflect on, uh, and I'm sure I speak for us all, uh, everybody joining us this morning, when I say that it was indeed a passionate uh, tour de force, as we've come uh, to expect indeed from President Higgins, uh, with plenty of scope for further questions in our Q&A session, which we will now uh, begin to embark on. Uh, there is lots of food for thought in this. I'm not even going to begin to pick up on some of the points. I hope you will in the Q&A. Uh, the President will rejoin us uh, very shortly. Uh, but, but in the meantime, uh, just to remind you uh, that if you have a question uh, that you'd like to put to the President, uh, please uh, send it to us now if you haven't already been sending them to us uh, using uh, the question and answer function which you will uh, see on your screen. Many of you are already familiar with the, the Zoom uh, functioning, but for those of you who are not, you can ask a question through the Q&A um, uh, function on, on the screen. And in the interest of, of getting to as many of these questions as, as we can in the time available, and we're hoping that the President can stay with us until just about 12.15. Um, may I ask you please to try and keep uh, your questions uh, as brief as possible so that we can um, allow, uh, uh, allow for as many of these questions to be addressed as we possibly, possibly can. And also, if you wouldn't mind, uh, please uh, do uh, identify your organization or indeed your affiliation uh, if, if you have one. And uh, when asking a question, uh, this obviously is important um, to provide a bit of background and context, uh, which the president um, will uh, be able to take into account when he's uh, addressing his, um, the, the, his replies. Um, as I said earlier on, we're, we're joined by many hundreds of people, not just from Ireland, uh, but uh, from around Europe and indeed from around the world. It's a tribute uh, to the president, President Higgins. Uh, to his advocacy and to his, um, uh, to his commitment uh, that, that so many people have taken uh, the opportunity to join with us this morning and to link up uh, with the IIAA for the President's uh, address. Finally, I, I just add uh, once more a reminder that this entire session and indeed the question and answers that, uh, that follow um, are, are indeed on the record so you're free uh, to use them uh, uh, appropriately uh, as, you, as, you see, as you see fit. Um, before getting to your questions, um, I'm going to um, ask um, Rory Quinn, uh, the chairman of the board of the IAEA, uh, to, to, who's with us on this webinar, to join in welcoming uh, President Higgins. And if he wishes to do so, of course, uh, he's, he's welcome to uh, offer an initial question uh, to the president as well. So uh, Rory, the floor is yours and um, to, to, to uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for your uh, elegant words. Uh, I have, first and foremost, a greeting from Brendan Halligan, who is the founding father of the Institute for International and European Affairs, who sends to you, uh, Michael D. Higgins, a particular warm welcome. You've always been a great supporter of the Institute, and indeed, you have honoured us by being a patron, and Brendan in particular, who has not had good health in recent times, wants that message to be portrayed to you. President, um, I would like to propose to you, uh, is it your belief that Europe at this time has the leadership and the will to develop the new relationship with Africa, which you have so eloquently articulated for us over the last some time? Well, first of all, may I reciprocate the greetings uh, to Brendan Halligan. I so hope he is getting well. Uh, your question, I think I would answer like this. Within the European discourse, I believe there is a very significant role for smaller countries. 
and particularly countries with development strategies that were, for example, not tied to advantages through effectively being hidden exports. So you have countries that are free of history, such as ourselves. Uh, you have countries, in fact, that have decent policies in relation to being ones that were not tied to other bilateral advantage. And then you have countries as well as that who have reputation in, in a multilateral sense, in the wider out of Europe institutions. But I see the discourse that I speak of in relation to getting to a new place being a really great opportunity uh, for these nations, such as Ireland and smaller countries and so forth, to be forceful, if you like, in, well, first of all, because the whole of Europe, we are all in, in the European Union. That necessary task that I mentioned must be got out of the way. I, I've said it more than once. Uh, there are you parts of Europe that would like to forget, but all of Africa wants to remember. We have to get past that, I quoted Hannah Arendt, as I've often quoted, so as to remove the capacity of the past from curtailing anything we might do into the pre in the present, and above all else, our prospects for the future. Yes, I see the discourse being initiated and pushed forward by the smaller members. Yeah, thank you, uh, President Higgins, um, for, for that um, reply. Thank you, Rory, indeed. Um, uh, I'm just going to come to questions now that have been coming in since you began your remarks and indeed um, uh, since you finished your remarks. And uh, what better place to start, indeed, w than with uh, Dr. Carlos Lopez himself, uh, who's uh, online and following us. So uh, his question to you, uh, President, is, President, you've been indeed an inspiration in the way you bring um, humanity to the political economy debate. What do you think are the consequences of this new phase of global order for the continent with the largest reservoir of youth? Yes. I think there is a great change happening and uh, uh, in the global order. Uh, but again, when you drill down into it, I think that there is a consciousness among the African countries, for example, of how you can uh, deal with, let us say, for example, the presence of China in Africa. And I think when one looks at it closely, one sees that different countries have succeeded better, some have succeeded better than others, in what you might call uh, uh, the cost of, let us say, embedded investment and, and, and so forth. But what I do think is very important, there, I, mean, I think in, in the case of the, in the, Euro, of the European Union, uh, you know, I think it was a Japanese economist who invented the flying geese metaphor. And I remember a conversation I once had, and I put to President Xi about what would a Chinese hegemony in the world order mean. He said, immediately, no, we went on straight away uh, to, the, to the idea of the lead goose and the other goose and the formation, geese and the formation and so on. I, I said, I know the origin of that. It was actually by a Japanese writer originally. But... Quite frankly, we can't, we, we can't allow uh, old forms of, we are too near uh, this er, ancient versions of Cold War politics that would be very destructive. Europe is close to Africa, and Europe must immediately see that African presence in Europe is welcome. Now, if we are in fact actually too, construct this partnership, it will, as I said, mean creating different forms of dialogue. Like I had said that the small countries have a great advantage. <clears throat> Many of the, of the members of the European Union have a relationship that is often predicated on bilateral advantage just in the negotiations. But in relation to the, in relation to, in, in to the global order, uh, it, it is a pessimistic time. I think it is a pessimistic time in relation to the deepening of democracy, the respect for rights of dissent, but also above all else for the increasing emphasis on, and of course the debate we're having in one of the most powerful countries, which is a very important debate on the removal of race from forms of discrimination and exclusion. Thank you, President. Um, just another question here on anthropology, if I may, uh, from oh, yes. Dara Lagan. Uh, so, he's, uh, Dara says, I'm um, very uh, much enjoying this uh, insightful, hopeful, and timely talk. He says, I have a question for the President. He says, you mentioned the potential contribution of anthropology. Please, can you expand on its role in generating important insights? 
Yes, I can, I, and I'll be very brief, but I spent from 1968 to 71 on and off at the Department of uh, Social Anthropology, Sociology at Manchester University. And I was really very interested in the work of people like J. Clyde Mitchell and others who had written very important work with looking at African migration and so on. And it became so clear, for example, I, I'd give an example of it, maybe from Lesotho migrants going to the mining sector in South Africa. People got to understand that if you increased the yield in real terms of their wages, that they went home faster. And this was, of course, because they had, in fact, targets such as bride wealth and others, and they were reaching it faster and so forth. There's a very famous uh, uh, essay, I think it's Elliot Berg, the backwards sloping supply function curve. But my interest in anthropology today is, 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 is very much this, is that if you have artificial boundaries and you need to deal with competing ethnic ambitions and so forth, you, you could do so much work, particularly I think in relation to understanding migration intra within Africa, but also understanding migration uh, uh, out of Africa. I, I have spoken before and sent some messages to the United Nations of what I think should be a global and regional response in relation to migration anyway. There, there are, we must deal with it. We must deal with it. But anthropology was so important because what it did was, unlike metrics, which might have been derived from a fairly narrow or even discredited version of applied economics, it was something in which you were listening in which you are taking the experience of the people at different generations into account. But it may also, I, I think of people like Howard Stein uh, from Michigan University and others. I, I have been a critic of, of others. I've been a, a, a critic very, very much of some of the work on, on titles assessment. For example, granting titles so that people can have, if you like, a collateral to go to private banks while ignoring uh, family structures and different structures of landholding is disastrous. That, those areas are just immediately suggest to me we should be using anthropology in our development models. Thank you. Thank you, President. I'm just going to take uh, two questions together, and they both relate to youth and younger people. And one is from our ambassador uh, in South Africa, Fanola uh, Gilson, and she says, what role does the President see in cultural expression and exchange to build new relations between young African, uh, young African and Europeans? But secondly, uh, from probably our youngest participant today, all of age 12, Maura Corrie, she wants to know what can young people do, and she also describes herself as a fan. Yes. Well, the first of all is we must support culture at home and in Europe and in Africa. This is a very vulnerable time for culture in Ireland. I think that one of the most vulnerable groups are the cultural workers in all of the different areas of performance. And I very much uh, look at how responding to COVID, for example, limited audiences in theatres, some shows closed down. It's a really difficult time. With the question the ambassador asked, and and I think and that young, that my young friend asks is a very important one. We must be open uh, to expressions of the human spirit in its different magical forms. I think, for example, uh, our own relationship with the history of dance. I think that uh, I think that I quote Professor J. Clyde Mitchell, with whom, with, under whom I studied myself, beautiful paper about Kalila dance, I remember it. But there is so much richness, both in color and sound and in movement, and in expressions of the body and so on in on that continent that we, we that we really can all gain from and i mean all all of us in europe we must think that way africa is not a problem the continent of africa is not a location it is a wonderful great space where we can redo the things we've done wrong and uh, that's how I feel about it. Oh, culture is incredibly important. Uh, and it should, we must re re realize that a very, 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 isn't it a great weakness in the European Union that it never privileged culture sufficiently? I say that as a former president of the Council of Culture Ministers in 1996. Very good, President. Um, a question here from Brendan Walsh uh, about, um, he says, do you see a danger in speaking of Africa as a whole 
um, as so often happens. He says the continent consists, of course, and I think you referenced this in your speech, of 54 countries, as well as a handful of breakaway states. And I wonder if you reckon that part of the conversation could be lost, or even specific countries such as small ones in terms of economy and population such as Togo, Benin, or Namibia be left out of the discussion in place of larger countries yes. and economies such as Ethiopia, Nigeria, Egypt, or South Africa that tend to dominate the conversation if we don't discuss the continent in more specificity. Oh, I think he makes a very good point. But that exclusion is being sponsored from abroad so often. It is when you go to New York and you hear it. Who wants to hear from the strongest at the cost of the weakest? Who wants to hear, if you like, from the people who are the most, the greatest potential in trade? It, both side forms of capital that are really interested in that. I do agree with them. Remember, I have made the case for anthropology. But I have also uh, said in the course of my paper as well that there are differences that must be, I actually said that they must be recognized. And that is so. I want to say another word about it as well. There isn't a single version of waged work which could be applied across the continent. But at the same time, I want to say this, that in, as a kind of a pan-African consciousness, the continent has been excluded from the security I think as well as that, there are other forms of balance of time, uh, balance of relationships and balances in culture. Because we must remember that in the case of colonization, we should know ourselves in Ireland where our language was prohibited to be used, is there was a significant suppression of culture. Remember I mentioned old pre-Canolian forms, for example in law, conflict resolution conflict pre prevention. Africans for hundreds of years had been dealing with issues of issues between movements of cattle and so forth. Yes, he is totally correct. We should in fact look at the continent in its diversity and its differing vulnerabilities and capacities. Uh, President Chu, you mentioned on a few occasions again there the, the Security Council of the United Nations and um, uh, of course, we're on the eve of a very significant vote uh, this time next week. In fact, this day next week, uh, when Ireland is, will, will, will be bidding for one of three seats on, on, the, on the Security yeah, Council. Yeah. And you, talk, you spoke in your speech about um, that at the Security Council, Ireland can show uh, leadership, that this is a place where we can show leadership on so many of the issues that you addressed in your speech. Uh, what kind of leadership can Ireland, you know, and, you know subject to, of course, the election, uh, being re-elected, being elected to the Security Council, what kind of I, leadership can Ireland show yes. um, in that environment? I think, and I spoke in New York on this, it can deliver authenticity. May I give you an example of the absence of authenticity? of another country, which I won't mention, which might be a candidate, of citing an arms deal for 14.5 billion with Saudi Arabia. There's a great difference between that approach and the approach, for example, of Irish aid, which whatever, there are many critics of this, that, or the other thing, but it has never been tied aid. So Ireland going to the Security Council, its best thing is to, in fact, actually deliver on what it has been saying to heads of state and which has got a great welcome. I think, for example, the small island development states whom I have welcomed here. I can think, for example, of the conversations I've had with Latin American countries and so forth. And they understand it. So Ireland has to be true to itself. And I think that it will be. I think all of this is from my conversations with the permanent representative and with many people in New York when I visited the United Nations last year. People just simply want Ireland to deliver authenticity in relation to some of these principles uh, that, that you've heard people like myself uh, enunciate. Thank you, President. Uh, just we're coming close to the end here now, and uh, I have a question here from David Dunny, who is, of course, one of our former ambassadors and somebody who's very um, close to the whole uh, um, uh, issue of, of development. And he says, um, uh, a powerful critique, he's referring to your speech, of course, a powerful critique of the inequitable uh, treatment of Africa. Africa needs strong multilateral uh, institutions and increased African participation in them. But is the president confident that the political will can be mobilized, mobilized to reform uh, the international financial institutions in this direction? I think it's a matter of urgency. I spoke to the president of Costa Rica quite recently 
a wonderful country that has done a great deal in relation to eco economic and ecological balance that I have been speaking about. But of course, it's suffering because of the effects of COVID and of the, the, its effect on tourism or whatever. And here is a, a totally unaccountable, set, a dangerous a set, of, set of possibilities. The role of the, the rating agencies, Standard & Poor and Finches and Moody's and the rest of them, downgrading a country's a, a country just at the very time when it's trying to come out of vulnerability. It is essential that the rating agencies go off the table while we're responding to COVID. And indeed, with a bad record, they're not very valuable in relation to anything we're speaking about in transformation and economics. I do think that there is, for someone at my age, having spent some time in universities in many ways, we're going to have to redefine economics. We, it is time for political economy. It's time for social economy. It's for a mixture between, if you like, ecological and social forms of economics. The problem is, is that Economics 101 is such a miserable experience in relation to anything I've been speaking about in so many parts, even, for example, I would know particularly Howard Stein and I have discussed this part of North America uh, and elsewhere. We must teach it differently. I agree with David on creating the political will. I choose, in fact, actually to make the case. Uh, but you must can't go into the, into the maw of the powerful in the Permanence and the Security Council, for example, and assume that you can't win. Uh, there are countries, uh, uh, I, I think for many countries, who have made small gains. Now is the time for big gains. Thank you, President. We're going to just take one uh, final question, if, if I may. Um, it just um, in relation to, um, uh, from somebody who will be well known to you, Peter McLoon, who's also an IEA board uh, member. He said, as always, uh, an excellent presentation by, by you, President Higgins. And looking across uh, the global uh, landscape, he inquires, at present, is the president optimistic uh, that things can get better in our relationship with and support uh, for Africa? And has Europe the capacity, I suppose, echoing Rory Quinn's question, has Europe the capacity and commitment to meet uh, the challenges that you so eloquently describe? And, and maybe just one final question, um, maybe to link it from Don Mullen. Uh, what is it about the Africa, Af Africa's uh, Great Green Wall uh, that inspires you? And if you were to address the heads of state of the African Union, uh, what would you say to them about this epic initiative? We'll, we leave it on those two questions, President. So, uh, okay. Well, I'll take the second first in relation to the Great Green Wall with which I've been associated. Its importance is African involvement and inter-state inter cooperation. And it's such an imaginative process, addressing desertification, the sowing as well as that the concept of renewal and growth. And so it's a most, and the Vatican, everyone, so many different countries have in fact actually seen is wonderful, wonderful proposal of hope, I, I would say. Uh, in relation to the, to, the, to the first question, remind me, dear chairman. Indeed, what was the first question? Uh, it was Peter McClone, I think. Uh, he wants oh, yeah. to know, yeah, about uh, just again, as always, uh, just uh, he wants to know about uh, the leadership issue uh, and wants to know whether you're optimistic that things can get better in our relationship with and support for Africa. Yes, I, I worry very, very much is that it, I, it's a separate set of papers I have given. I, I, I produce a book at the end of this year called Recovering the European Street. And I think there are problems in the European Union. And in many ways, particularly that young person who asked me questions, so many of the young people, they are ahead of the political voices of the strongest in particular. The future of the European Union is not going to be the outcome of a conversation between France and Germany. If it was, it wouldn't be much of a union. It has to be a union that involves all Europeans. I, I can't allow myself to be pessimistic, but what I do think is wonderful I am actually seeing the way in which huge support, for example, for environmental issues shifted onto the ideas of sustainability and climate change, and also the way in which they were able to move on to issues of race. And I think that is so important. It shows, in fact, that we have uh, generations of all, many generations, there are some very older people who are quite disappointed 
that their hopes in relation to all of this. Remember those of us who, for example, were involved in the original uh, opposition to apartheid and so forth. There are many of us who have had hopes that haven't been realized, but that doesn't mean that they're quenched. But there are generations that I am certain that will succeed in a much shorter time period than we had ever imagined. Thank you, uh, President, indeed. And one of that younger generation, I, 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 I gave her the wrong name. She's in fact, she was Ellie Dixon. Uh, the question was posed by Maura Curry, but the, the young 12 year old who asked the question about youth was, was, was Ellie Dixon. So it'd be a bad session indeed if we misnamed, we misnamed her. Uh, so I apologize for that, uh, but just want to acknowledge her uh, and to acknowledge you, Mr. President, again, uh, Ron, just to say thank you. Uh, the time is against us, I'm afraid. I think we could go on for a lot, lot longer. <laughs> and it's a huge subject matter and a very sincere thank you to you for sharing this morning with us and to our wider audience and providing such an ins insightful and eloquent uh, presentation on your vision for, for Europe and for Africa. And let's just hope that this is a relationship that can be developed and that the passion that you have, President, uh, can help drive this agenda forward and bring it indeed to the new level to which you so clearly and all of us also aspire. So thank you, President. Um, no, it's been a pleasure. It was wonderful to share these ideas. Sharing ideas is essential for our future. Thank you.